So my name's Christina Hauser. I'm down at Hospital Center. Um, we have a very full session, so we'll try to do as much as we can. Um, we're going to go through quite a few things in a PowerPoint, and then at the end we'll circle back and go over the EKGs that you guys were just looking at. We'll go over some interpretation strategies, uh, geography as I like to call it, and then arrhythmias, and lastly ischemia. So um, I like to approach EKGs the same way every time. When you get to a really tough EKG that you don't know what to do with it, it's nice to be able to fall back on a very specific interpretation strategy. So when I look at an EKG, I look at it the same way every time. So I look at the rate, the rhythm, the axis, the intervals, ST segments, and then the T waves. So to break it down even further, um, when you look at the rate, is it normal, meaning 60 to 100? Is it fast, meaning over 100? Or is it slow, meaning less than 60? The rhythm, is it sinus or not sinus? And then when you're having a hard time kind of figuring out the rhythm from there, is it regular or irregular? Um, and we'll touch on this quite a bit later. Um, and then your axis, is it normal, left or right? And um, there's also an extreme axis deviation that we'll touch on briefly. Um, and then your intervals, are they normal, narrow, wide? And then your ST segments, normal, elevated or depressed? And your T waves, peaked or inverted? Um, so as we go through the EKGs together as a group, I'm going to ask you guys to go through this on each EKG. Um, if you want to write it down now, that's great. Um, if not, we'll kind of remind you as we go through each EKG. Um, so starting with the rate. So you're going to count the ventricular rate. Um, this is one of the very few things that you can look at the machine read for. It'll tell you at the top. Um, if there's no machine read on the ventricular rate for some reason, I like to count down by looking at the big boxes, um, which is exactly this. So each big box is 200 milliseconds. When you're going to count it down, you're counting the QRS. If the QRS to QRS is one big box, that's a rate of 300. Two is 150. Three is 100. 475 and 560. Unfortunately, those are sort of numbers that you just have to memorize, but it's a nice quick way if you're trying to do a quick and somewhat accurate count. Um, rhythm. This is, I think, the hardest thing for people um, is trying to sort of interpret the rhythm. So a sinus rhythm means that there must be a P wave before every QRS and a QRS after every P. If you don't have that, you're not in a sinus rhythm. Um, and from there, you need to try to determine what rhythm you're in. So your other options are generally going to be atrial, junctional, or tachycardia. Your atrial rhythms are still going to have a narrow QRS. Your junctional rhythms will be narrow, but the P wave may be within the QRS or retrograde or after. And then your ventricular rhythms are going to be your wide, complex QRS. So that's how you start to differentiate those. There's always sort of exceptions to this rule, but that's, that's a nice rule of thumb to go with. Um, axis. I do this very simply, and I still do this in the ER to this day. I use the two thumb method. Um, so your left thumb is going to correlate with the QRS in lead one, and your right thumb will correlate with the QRS in AVF. Um, so if both thumbs are pointing up, it's normal. In this example, you can see the QRS is down in lead one. So your right thumb is up, which means it's a right axis deviation. The same is true if you flip that, if your left thumb is up and your right thumb is down, you've got a left axis deviation. Um, it's a very quick, easy way to do this. Um, and you're looking where the bulk of the QRS complex is pointed, up or down. Um, this is just to remind everyone it, it comes from this circle that we all see and know from cardiophysiology. Um, once again, a reminder, one in AVF, both up, you're normal. One up, uh, AVF down, you're going to be left axis. Flip that where one is down and your right thumb is up. You're going to be right axis. And if they're both down, that's your extreme axis. Um, intervals. So your PR interval should be less than 200 milliseconds. If it's longer than that, then it's going to signify a first degree AV block. Your QRS should be less than 120 milliseconds. Um, if it's wider than that, you maybe have a bundle branch block or some kind of ventricular rhythm. And then your QTC, for the purpose of the ER, should be less than 500. The textbook answer is 450. Um, in general, in the ER, most of us will use 500 as our idea of when it's um, starting to get long and you need to worry about it. Um, this is just a quick review. Um, your little boxes are 40 milliseconds. Your big boxes are 200 milliseconds. Um, so your PR interval should be less than one big box. And then when you're looking at the QTC, 
generally should be less than about two and a half of the bigger boxes. And your QRS should be three little boxes. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. And this is just a quick review on intervals. Um, I know everybody knows this, but your PR interval um, going from the start of the P wave uh, to the start of the R wave, and then your QRS going from the start of the Q wave um, through the S wave, your ST segment, through the S wave to the end of the T wave. Does anybody know what we use the TP segment for or why that's important to discuss? Yeah, so the TP segment is what we call the isoelectric point. So when you want to compare your ST segment for elevations or depressions, this is what you should be comparing it to within each lead. Um, so that's, that's really why we want to focus on that or think about that. And speaking of our ST segments, when you're looking at EKG, you're looking for elevations, depressions, and then I always am looking for T wave inversions too as your signs for ischemia. So I know there's a lot of information really fast. Like I said, we're gonna go through this on each EKG. Everyone will have some time to practice. Um, so geography, how many of you guys put your own leads on? No one. Um, so the only reason this is important to know for um, specific EKGs, such as right-sided EKGs or posterior EKGs, it's helpful to know where to put the leads because um, a lot of times your staff won't know, so it's good to be able to give that direction. Um, so this is kind of your basic five lead. Um, the way I used to learn this is right on white, smoke over fire. Um, so it's right arm is your white lead, uh, left arm is your black lead, and then your left leg is red, and then the green and, and uh, brown will be your right leg and the center respectively. They should all be labeled as such, R-A-L-A, -A, things like that. So you should be able to kind of piece that together. Um, so in your normal EKG, um, your placement is going to be V1 and V2 on either side of the sternum at the fourth intercostal space. V4 will go at the fifth intercostal space at the midclavicular line. So you kind of put V3 in between V2 and V4. And then moving laterally in that fifth intercostal space will be V5 and V6. So where this gets more interesting for you guys or what you need to know, is what to do with a right-sided EKG, um, which is more or less just flipping all those leads. So if we look at where we were here, you're gonna flip that. So V1 will be at your left side of the sternum at the fourth intercostal space, V2 over on the right side, V4 on the right side, fifth intercostal space, maybe clavicular line, V3 in between them, and then V5 and V6 moving laterally. And then probably the trickiest, but I think most important one, is your posterior EKG, which you're going to need to obtain looking for a posterior infarction and posterior STEMI. Um, so if you look, V4, V5, and V6 um, in your normal EKG, you're going to take those leads and you're just going to slide them in order around to the left side posterior. So V4 will become V7, V5 will become V8, and V6 will become V9. And you're going to slide them with V7 on the lateral side, left posterior, V8 next to it, and then V9 next to it, so moving lateral to medial. When you look at it, a posterior EKG, these are still leads V4, 5, and 6 on the machine, so it will print out as V4, 5, and 6, and then you'll have to cross out and put V7, V8, V9, because um, you know that you have obtained a, a posterior EKG. Um, and you're generally going to use this looking for posterior STEMIs, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Okay, so we're going to approach uh, the bulk of them. There's a couple of rhythm straps but with the method that we talked about in the beginning, so rate, rhythm, axis, intervals, ST segments. So I'm gonna have you go through each of those. So here's our first example of SVT. Um, you guys will see it again. Normal axis, perfect. Something is definitely off. ST segment depressions. Um, it's a narrow complex regular tachycardia and that narrow versus wide is gonna help direct you atrial versus ventricular. It's SVT <laughs> again with, we're seeing ST segment depressions does anybody know why we're seeing that in the CKG? So your rate is so fast that you're seeing some ST segments due to demand. Once this rhythm breaks and they go back to a slower rhythm, those ST segment depressions should resolve. Um, so the ST segment depressions here can be a normal finding. So this is again, a fast, narrow, complex rhythm um, should make you, that's very regular, should make you think SVT. Starting with the rate, so somewhere in the normal range, it's, irregular, do we think it's sinus rhythm or not sinus rhythm? No P waves? There's no P, so there's no PR interval, perfect. I know it's, it's really hard to tell um, for the purpose that we're going to call it narrow, it should be 
should be less than 500, so QTC should be normal. So putting it all together, this is uh, atrial fibrillation. All right, it's a little bit of an abnormal morphology in V2. Um, the segment itself, I would say, probably looks okay. You probably have some inversions here. Um, but I don't know that the whole segment is down. This one's a little bit hard to see. Perfect, excellent. Okay, next up. This one's a little bit hard, it's very irregular. Um, it's probably not quite that slow. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna help you with a machine read on this one because it's hard to tell. Well, let's, let's say it's about 70. No P waves. It has that nice sawtooth pattern of the atrial rhythm and then you're seeing the QRS complexes. Um, the only thing I think you missed on that one was the axis. Um, so all in all, this is uh, atrial flutter. Okay. Oh good, this is a good front row EKG. Oh good. Oh. Just normal axis? Yeah, normal axis. Perfect. We finally have P waves, so we oh, get to talk about that now. That's long. Remind us all what normal is for a PR interval. Uh, it should be less than one big box. Yeah, Perfect. Big box. So prolonged PR interval is going to be your first degree AV block. All right, getting trickier as we go. So we'll look at our rhythm strip on lead two here. But we've got a P wave here, and then our PR interval is getting a little bit longer. P wave here, here, here. No, it's one. You got it. You did it. All right, um, no, okay. you've got a P wave here. Okay, so a sign is? P wave here, P wave here, P wave here. P wave here. Okay. Your PR interval, you think it's less than 200? Yes. Okay, and then here, we don't have a PR interval. We don't have one, okay. Yep, yep. And then your QRS, less than 120, less than three little boxes? Yes. Good. And your QT, yes. less, than, less than 500? So less than two and a half of the, the big boxes. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. Okay. Good. Two and a half of the big Good. boxes. Good. So you've got a fixed PR interval with a dropped QRS complex. Mobitz type two. So it's it's another because I remember there's two second degree AV blocks. Your Mobitz one and two. Your Mobitz one will have that progressively prolonging PR interval until it drops. Your Mobitz type two will have a PR interval that's the same the whole way until that beat drops. Um, which one's worse, Mobitz 1 or Mobitz 2? Good. Okay. The arrows are hopefully helping you march, yeah. march your beats here. Third degree block, perfect. Does everybody understand why? Um, so your P waves are occurring kind of at a set rate. If you were to mark two out on a piece of paper or with your calipers, you can march it down the strip and they'd be the same every time. And your QRS is sort of occurring very randomly throughout. There's no association between your P wave and your QRS, making a complete heart block. All right, this is just another example here, giving you guys a look at a rhythm strip of complete heart block where the, the P waves are occurring at a set interval and your QRS is occurring without any association with the P waves whatsoever. Everybody likes to talk about bundle branch blocks, so we'll touch on that quickly. Um, so to have a bundle branch block, you have to have a QRS that's a little bit wide, so greater than 120. Um, in a left bundle branch block, you're going to have a downgoing QRS in V1. And you'll see here, you've got your wide QRS, so it's greater than three little boxes going down in V1. is kind of the quickest way to tell. And then on the flip side, your right bundle branch block, you're going to have a wide QRS that's up in V1 with that typical kind of rabbit ear shape that we all heard about. And here's the example here on an EKG. Alrighty, where do we leave off? This is another, another quick one um, where you don't have the opportunity to go through the whole thing, but can give us an interpretation of what you think of the um, rhythm and then specifically the intervals might lead you to the diagnosis on this one. We've got a wide complex tachycardia should lead you towards a ventricular rhythm and ventricular tachycardia specifically in this case. All right. Close. Look down at this, the, this bottom one is the one that kind of gives you the clearest picture because this is a little bit of a confusing EKG. It's that sort of fine, coarse, uh, very irregular rhythm that's going to be your ventricular fibrillation. I agree with you. I think here um, this looks torsadzi, but the reason that's happening is because these are all the different leads, um, so showing you different amplitudes in each lead. Moving on. Perfect. Before we move on to the ST segments, we're going to do a quick chat about geography because when you want to approach ischemia, kind of looking at each section of the heart. So when I look for ST segment changes, I go geographically. So knowing your septal leads are going to be V1, V2, and your kind of anterior here, 
and then moving laterally v4, 5, and 6. So I'll look at them together. And then 1 and AVL are going to be your high lateral leads. I look at those two together. And then your inferior leads are 2, 3, and AVF. Look at those together. Um, AVR is the lead everyone ignores. Mm -hmm. um, so the time I find AVR to be the most useful lead, if you have elevations in AVR, it can be a sign of early left anterior occlusion. Um, so you kind of have to remember to look at AVR in these. All righty. Here you got ST elevation all over the place. I would say maybe here you're starting to see a little bit of your depressions in your inferior, your reciprocal changes in your inferior leads. But yeah, another, there's a big STEMI happening here in these guys. All right. I would say one and AVL are both elevated, mm -hmm. um, consistent with a lateral STEMI. And then those depressions are going to be your reciprocal changes. Okay. All right. And this is just my quick, once again, my plug about AVR. Don't forget that this is going to be a good indicator of your early LAD occlusion. This is a, um, a tricky EKG because there's a part, there's a hidden part in this that we're going to discuss a little bit more later. Um, quick plug. So here you're seeing your elevations in 2, 3, and AVF, mm -hmm. consistent with your inferior STEMI. Um, what I want to talk about is V2 and V3. Whenever you see big depressions in V2 and V3, you always need to look for posterior involvement. And that's when you need to get your posterior EKG. So this is another example here. So here's V2 and V3. You've got these big depressions here. Um, again, we're seeing big depressions, V2, V3. So you're going to ask for your posterior EKG. And those leads 7, 8, and 9 you put on the back, all of a sudden, you're going to see your STEMI. All right. Um, thanks, everyone.